it is funny. I spent the first 10 years of my career telling people who had never used technology what technology could be used for. Mm -hmm. And now I'm spending more of my time telling people who use technology what it was like before. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> technology totally. was there. Right. I'm translating in both directions. Few people understand the internet better than Douglas Brushkoff. Lots of people have figured out how to make money online or how to build influence or create political momentum. But as a media theorist, author, and professor, Rushkoff has built his career helping us all understand not just what we do on the internet, but what the internet is doing to us. He's a professor of media theory and digital economics at City University of New York in Queens. And after writing more than 20 books and hosting over 250 episodes of his Team Human podcast, Rushkoff has emerged as a biographer of the internet, chronicling the evolution of the digital landscape where most of us spend most of our time. In fact, many of the phrases we use to talk about the internet, from viral media to social currency, were coined by Rushkoff himself. Which is why Douglas Rushkoff is the perfect person to help us understand this unique moment in time, when the proliferation of AI technology is forcing us to interrogate everything we know about how humans and computers interact. I'm Charlotte Alter, Senior Correspondent for Time, and this is Person of the Week. And this happens to be an especially exciting week for me to share this conversation with you all. Earlier today, Time released its first ever Time 100 AI list, the latest expansion of our iconic Time 100 franchise that highlights the leaders, policymakers, artists, and entrepreneurs advancing major conversations about how AI is reshaping the world. Make sure to visit time.com slash time100ai to see the full list after the episode. Um, I have an 18-month-old. Mm. Do they use an iPad yet? <laughs> <laughs> Not really, no. Um, Just the watch, right? Yeah. <laughs> she tweets. Um, I think a lot about how, like, I remember when I was growing up, there were newspapers everywhere because my parents were constantly reading the newspaper. Like, I got stitches from slipping on newspapers and stuff. And also— <laughs> You were wounded by your parents' oh, yeah. media. That's and also great. the TV was always on. Like, the TV news was always right. on. It was always, like, Peter Jennings, Katie Couric, The Today Show. Yeah. And— I remember things from that time. I remember I turned off Barney to watch Richard Nixon's funeral. Oh, my God. Funeral. Come on, everybody. <laughs> Kids, don't miss this. <laughs> but I think about this a lot because, like, now in the morning when my husband and I read the newspaper, we're reading it on our phones. Our daughter has no access to the news, quote, unquote, in the way that I did. There's right. no TV that's on. There's no newspaper that she's picking up and playing with or slipping on or whatever, or seeing a picture of somebody and saying, who's that? There's no way for a small child to have any idea what's going on in the world, which is really interesting. I do think about that a lot. The great thing about physical newspapers, about real-world stuff, is it gives your kids the opportunity for mimesis. And they access. Can, well, access, but they can also see what does a human being look like when they're reading the paper? Mm -hmm. What is that? You know, what is it when my dad, I'm when, oh, there's war. I don't want to see the war and turn the page. Yeah. Or I, we used to go on the train and there were these guys who had this very intricate way of folding the newspaper. And I feel like as our reality becomes increasingly touch screeny, I mean, it becomes much more visual on a certain level, but it's way less tactile. It's way mm -hmm. less experiential. You know, yes. And in some ways, less accessible too. Okay, so that leads me to why I wanted to have you on the show today. In the last 30 years, you've written a ton of books, and most of them have been about technology and the relationship between the internet and society. And so I view you as a sort of like biographer of the internet. Do you have any thoughts on how the internet has shaped the different generations? Yeah. The way that you make sense of the world is largely defined by the media environment that you are grown up in when you're five, six, mm. seven, eight years old. Yeah. If you're raised in a scribal world and that's the way you make sense of the world, it's going to be different than if you're raised in a printing press world or a radio world or a television world. What's a scribal world? Written, the text before we had printing press, when you oh, wrote okay. things down, when everything was, you know— Handwritten. Handwritten, yeah. yeah the scribal environment. So we've moved recently from a television media environment 
to a digital media environment. And they're really different. Television is the whole world together watching the moon landing. You know, digital is very different. Digital is discrete. Mm -hmm. It's everything's broken up into its own thing. So tell me about just growing up. I mean, was there a piece of technology that fascinated you as a kid? Um, I was into hi-fi and audio and stuff Mm. like that. I mean, I was fascinated and still am by the way radio works. I think it was my grandfather gave me a Radio Shack radio kit. And it was this little thing you made. And in the middle, there was a crystal. Hmm. Radio comes through the crystal like a radio signal, and then you amplify it through a speaker. So I was like, how does that radio wave get, how does it tune into there? People say they understand it, but it's still magic. They know how to work it, but nobody really knows. So I was into that. Hmm. When I was playing with computers as a kid, my parents were worried. They thought playing with computers meant you were going to be like a Dungeons and Dragons kid or something. Mm -hmm. You were throwing your life away to make video games, to play Space Invaders. It didn't seem real. And when I was in middle school and high school, I got interested in computers because this is back in the day when there was like one mainframe computer at the Board of Education. And Mm -hmm. then as part of it, they put three little terminals in the math center for kids to use. And it was the nerdiest of nerd kids, kids that you were socially ostracized if you hung out with them. This was in the 70s when Kids really teased harder maybe than they do now, in real life at least. Yeah. Um, But there was something about their culture that fascinated me because it was a culture of service. Hmm. You know, we'd be in a class and the assistant principal would come and be like, Michael, we need you. And they would pick the 14-year-old kid Hmm. out of eighth grade chemistry to go fix the mainframe computer for the Board of Education. (laughs) And I was like, why do kids understand this so much better than adults? Yeah. And so why did they? Because their brains are more open. You know, the myelin sheaths haven't formed around Mm -hmm. their frontal lobes yet, I guess. They're just more spongy. They have more uh, neuroplasticity. So they were learning this in this way. And they became, to me, kind of heroes. They knew the secret codes that could make all this stuff work. And I was never good enough to actually really, really do it myself, but I played with it. And it was just this amazing sense of power. And then in college, I remember we had to write a thesis. And so we used a computer because, you know, doing it on typewritten pages and trying to make a change. People should only know what it was like to write when I used to have to write. But we used computers, and I remember the end of my first session, I called over the graduate student to help me save the file. And she said, do you want to save it as a read-only file or a read-write file? I'm like, what does that mean? Mm-hmm. She said, well, if you could save it as a read-only file where other people could read your file, or a read-write file where anyone who opens it can also edit it. I'm like, read, read, write. I said, well, save it as read-write. That's cool. Yeah. Let's see what people, if anyone finds it, what they want to do. And then when I left the computer lab, I start looking at the world and I said, wait a minute, I've been raised in a read-only media universe. Huh. Television's read-only. The newspaper's read-only. My money is read-only. What if it was read-write? And I felt like, well, we're moving from an arbitrarily read-only reality into a read-write one. More from the biographer of the internet, Douglas Rushkoff, on what it means to be human when we come back. I want to get big picture for a second. For most of your career, you've been in many ways a techno-optimist. And recently, there's been a change. And you've been focusing a lot about how technology and capitalism intersect with each other. What's interesting, I mean, the first time I've had this interview question, in other words, recently, Mm. you seem to have soured on tech, was around 1996. (laughs) Right? Okay. So I've always been somewhat hopeful Mm -hmm. about the possibilities of digital technologies to increase human autonomy and agency, to change the balance of power, to challenge capitalism, and at the same time, horrified Mm -hmm. at the ways in which we actually use it. So I end up experiencing this series of shocks Mm -hmm. because from the late 80s to the early 90s, for me, 
digital technology was sort of part of the psychedelic counterculture. Mm -hmm. It was, we can do anything. Let's remake society from the bottom up. But 1993, Wired magazine came along and really recontextualized the internet as this business story. They said, we're going to have a long boom. And thanks to the internet, the economy and the NASDAQ stock exchange will grow exponentially. Mm. And that's the first time I was like, well, wait a minute. No, 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 no. Don't put banks on this thing. We're playing here. This is not a secure space. And, you know, there was the dot-com crash mm -hmm. at the end of the 90s. And I'm like, yay, we're back. It's the people's net. We're going to get social and we have social media. And then <laughs> it's like, oh, that's going to fail. Now we're going to get AI and we're going to play again. But I'm in the latest time of like, okay, yet another opportunity has been squandered. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't know how many turns of the wheel we have left. Yeah. So it sounds like what you're describing is like a cycle between hope and fear. Yeah. So if we're talking about a recent turn, for me, it's realizing that, oh, technology is cool and all, but it's missing the point. It can't see us. It can only see the data. And the more we treat the digital as somehow conveying the real, the less we value and recognize the soft, squishy in between, the mm -hmm. liminal stuff that actually makes being alive alive. So when did you realize this? Is this something you have been realizing your whole time covering tech and writing about technology and the internet? Or is this something that you realized recently? So in the early days when I was writing about digital technology in the early 90s, even for Time Digital, I wrote this piece called They Called Me Cyber Boy. Those days, I was really interested in expressing, oh, look at the new potentials for a collected human nervous system. Hmm. But what I saw then was once business came in, people started betting on the net. The net was no longer about new possibilities. The net was about increasing probabilities. Hmm. Betting on something, you want the highest possible probability of a return. Hmm. And that was when I was like, oh, there's this other trend. Instead of technology being tools for weird people to make unpredictable stuff, we use technology on people to make them act more predictably. Right. And, you know, I think at this point, technology should be a last resort for anybody. Just do favors for your neighbors. Meet your neighbors. Mm -hmm. Engage with your neighborhood. Go local. Yeah. Make eye contact with people. You know, it's like, especially after COVID, trying to help people retrieve the basic social mechanisms that allow us to get along with each other. That's so interesting. I feel like you have a really unique perspective on this because you're somebody that deeply understands how the internet works, how digital technology works, but you also really remember a time before it. So I feel like your perspective on this is really unique because there are not that many people who remember so well that read-only right. time. It is funny. And I spent the first 10 years of my career telling people who had never used technology what technology could be used for. Mm -hmm. And now I'm spending more of my time telling people who use technology what it was like before. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Technology totally. was there. Right. I'm translating in both directions. But the other thing about having watched it happen was I saw what the technology could be used for before it was arbitrarily limited to what it is. Huh. In other words, it's as if we took the read-write possibilities of the internet and made it read-only. Hmm. Now we use the web. We don't create the web actively. Hmm. They let you think that the competency of the internet age is being able to upload text and pictures to social media sites. Hmm. That's not the competency of this age. That's the competency of the printing press era hmm. and the photography era. It's funny. We get a new technology and the people, the masses, are given the competency of the media transition prior. Explain that. What we do you mean? We got the printing press, right? When we got the printing press, did people gain the ability to print? No. No, you had to be an authorized agent mm -hmm. to print. If you had a printing press and were using it and the king didn't know about it, they would come and smash the press and kill you. The competency that we got with the printing press, the people got, was reading. Hmm. And the elite got to print. Hmm. Now we get computers. What are the masses getting? We can print. Yeah. We can type. We're getting the competency of the printing press era. What are the elite getting? They're programming the environments in which we do that. Right. They're contextualizing the economic and social relationships around this. 
programming is the competency of the hmm. stage, and none of us know how to do that. So you've been chronicling all these twists and turns of the internet for 30 years. And so how did we get from that place of like fun and exploration and playful possibility to the moment we're in right now where a lot of people feel like we're on the doorstep of dystopia? I mean, most simply, I think we looked at the territory of the internet as the net itself. Hmm. In the early days, it was all these wires and where do they go? The territory of the internet today is the humans. It's the people. Interesting. The users, right? Hmm. And that's very different. It was like there's a shared hallucination that we're going to have. And whoever is able to paint the most interesting picture will get the most people supporting that vision. Mm -hmm. So it really felt almost like we're going to sit in a room and stare at a white wall and tell stories about what's on that wall, and that's what we're going to build together. And that was why it felt so freeing and optimistic and psychedelic in a way. Let's hallucinate a new reality mm -hmm. together. But then it became something else. You're not doing it for fun and play and experimentation. You're doing it for survival or something, or power. Right. So I want to ask you, you know, there are some people in this world— who are like, don't read books. Books are for suckers. Anything that would be in a book can be in a 600-word blog post. Right. So why do you write books? Why is books your medium if you're talking about internet and technology? Saying books are for suckers because you could get it in 600 words is like saying life is for suckers because you could get it in 6,000 words. Are you reading a book for the data? Hmm. If you are reading the book for the data and you can get the data in 600 words, then sure, then fine. I guess you could get the gist of the argument of the thesis in 600 words. You know, if someone once asked me years ago, why should I read your book? See, read my book for the experience of reading my book. This drive not to participate, hmm. to discount every actual experience as somehow subordinate to the derivative hmm. of the experience, right? You think about the stock market. The stock market dovetailed so well with digital technology that we got all these digital derivatives exchanges and ultra-fast trading algorithms and all that. So much so that the derivatives exchange purchased the New York Stock Exchange in 2013, right? So that means the stock exchange, which is already an abstraction of a real market, was consumed by its own abstraction. So the real thing keeps going away. So it's the physical world being drawn up into abstract units of data and finance because ultimately they believe that digital representation is more important than matter. That's an ends justifies the means logic to discount the experience of everything that's actually happening now for a digital fantasy of a tech bro future. Yeah. So I want to talk about being human, which in some ways this whole conversation has been yeah. about. Obviously, AI is now very much in the conversation. You know, there are some people who say, oh, this is a fun toy. There are some people who say, oh, they're going to eliminate all these jobs. There are some people who say, this is going to kill everybody on the planet. It's hard to know how to think about this. How are you thinking about AI? I mean, it's dangerous for high school kids because they're tempted to use it to write papers. But these are not thinking things. They're probability engines. They are creating the most probable responses of words based on what's happened. They are language models. And the punchline of this is if they really are using our behaviors to model what they do and how they interact with us and what they're going for, then the only way to raise good AIs is for us to start acting good ourselves. Hmm. It's really what it comes down to. It, when you're raising a kid, it's not what you tell your kid. It's what your kid witnesses. It doesn't matter if you tell them, be nice to other people. They do what you do. Same with AIs. They don't care what we tell them. They're using the entire database of every response that we've had. And in online situations, mind you, they don't see the real world. They see the internet. So how we behave on the internet is how we're 
teaching them to be. And that's a little scary, right? Especially if we give them more and more power, if we let them decide who gets to live in this neighborhood, who gets this loan, who gets this job, how long is my prison sentence? Those kind of things, those decisions that we're already giving these algorithms, that's of concern to me if they're using the data set of who we are. How can we protect this real world against more tech expansion? Um, and I think the way you do it is through ecstatic experiences, experiences mm. of bliss, get people in the body. I see tons of people in their 20s saying, I want to go to agricultural college. I want to learn this. Huh. You're seeing that now? Or you yeah. That? Yeah. And so I think the way through is to help people experience deep social connection, get them making eye contact mm. again, touching, going in water, uh, yeah. you know, right. walking barefoot. There are— Existing in your body. Right. Because yeah. there are these really sublime experiences that you can have embodied that you really can't have outside yeah. your body. This Seems just, hard. It it does. It yeah. seems like it'd be difficult. And why bank on it while right. you, you know, <laughs> while you're here? There are a lot of people who've spent their lifetimes thinking about technology, as you have, who have decided I'm going to use that to start a company. I'm going to use that to code. I'm going to use that to develop software. Did you ever consider doing that? Um, perhaps stupidly. I never thought the internet would be good business. The internet to me is such a tool for renaissance. Mm. And it's like, hmm. God, why would I want to get that mixed up with how I earn a living or where I do my banking? To me, the internet is still a dream space. It's like a collective consensual hallucination space, right? So the original set and setting of the internet, you know, the mindset that you're in and the setting that you're doing it in was the unbridled capacity of the collective human imagination mm -hmm. in a spirit of kind of psychedelic hippie wonder. Yeah. Over time, the set and setting of the internet became surveillance, control, and techno solutions. Mm -hmm. Now, we have been, as a civilization, as a society, we have been living on an essentially psychedelic substrate for the past 30 years with a set and setting of surveillance, control, and techno solutionism. Right. That's why what my job is, I see it, is how do I talk this society down off this bad techno trip? Mm -hmm. Right. And it's by getting them back in the body. Breathe. You're safe. Feel your feet on the ground. Make eye contact with a loved one. Hold their hand. You're here. You're here on the ground with other people who love you. The net is not real. Right. This is. So this has just been a fascinating journey into the forces behind the technology that's shaping all of our lives. But now we want to hear a little bit more about the little things that shape you in a segment we like to call The Last Time. Okay. Okay. When's the last time you downloaded an app? Um, gosh, I was probably the Delta Airlines app because then you could get movies on the plane. When was the last time you cried watching a movie? Um, trying to think. I think it was Spielberg's movie about his life. Oh, yeah. You know, and the, um, it's not even that poignant a moment. The, um, bully asks him, why did you make me look good in your movie? Mm -hmm. And it was just like, I don't know. It hit me. I love that part too. Yeah. Okay. When's the last time you felt starstruck? I mean, I was starstruck in one moment early on that was so powerful that nothing else has come close. What was it? I was at a Director's Guild party for Kurosawa, and Barbara Streisand walked in the room. And I was facing the opposite way, and I felt heat on the back of my head and the back of my body. I felt like there was sunlight. And I turn around, and it's Barbara Streisand Literally, like, beaming life energy. And I was like, oh, that's what a star is. It's another kind of human. There was something else there. Huh. You know, and I was just like, oh, I, I believe in magic now. I believe in life after death. I believed in everything after that. Because it was like, dang, 
Wow. Yeah. That's interesting. Okay, when's the last <laughs> time you thought, I'm never doing that again? Um, you know what? Ikea. Oh, okay. I went through Ikea, the whole maze that they make you go through or whatever, and I got through and I saw the people with their pallets and stuff, and I was like, I am never, do- I'm just never doing that again. Yeah. Never. Thank you so much for listening to our conversation with the brilliant Douglas Rushkoff. If you want to learn more about his big, big thoughts on the forces shaping the internet, he's the author of more than 20 books, including most recently, Survival of the Richest, Escape Fantasies of the Tech Billionaires. And he's also the host of the Team Human podcast. And be sure to check out our first ever Time 100 AI list, which highlights the leaders, policymakers, artists, and entrepreneurs defining how AI is reshaping the world. Make sure to visit time.com slash time 100 AI to see the full list. Thank you so much for listening to Person of the Week. If you liked what you heard, don't forget to subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. And we would love to hear from you. So send us your tips or thoughts on our show to personoftheweek at time.com. I'm Charlotte Alter. See you next week. Person of the Week is hosted by Charlotte Alter. It's produced by Nina Bisbano and India Witkin. Our senior producer is Ursula Summer. Our story editor is Katie Feather. This episode was mixed by Cedric Wilson. Our theme music was composed by Billy Libby. Joseph Frischmuth is our fact checker. Person of the Week is a co-production of Time Studios and Trigger 23. At Time, our executive producers are Mike Beck and Sam Jacobs. At Trigger 23, our executive producers are Mike Mayer, Michael Sugar, and Liam Billingham. Sasha Mathias is the head of audio at Time. You can find us online at time.com slash person of the week and wherever you get your podcasts.